Uh, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Dr. Peter Kovacs. And uh, he finished medical school in Hungary, and then he had a residency and a fellowship in the United States, uh, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine. And he, after finishing, uh, he went back to Hungary, and uh, he is working for the Kali Institute IVF Center, and he published numerous papers in this field. Uh, please start your lecture, Peter. Session chairs, dear colleagues, good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to try to take some of these issues further, and uh, I don't know if you will have a better idea about what to do with poor responders at the end of my uh, presentation, but the topic of my presentation is GnRH agonist versus GnRH antagonist for ovarian stimulation pros and cons. Now, the first successful IVF treatment, which was reported in uh, 1978 by Edwards and Stepto, was actually done in a natural cycle. And for years to come, uh, IVF was practiced um, in a natural cycle. Later on, oral antiestrogens were used to increase um, egg yield. And then, again, later on, this was combined with uh, menopausal gonadotropin to further improve stimulation outcome. The addition of GnRH agonist was a, a huge step forward because um, it uh, increased the efficacy of the treatment. Cycle cancellation was reduced but it also introduced uh, a higher complication rate as ovarian hyperstimulation um, uh, was seen more often. This was followed by the introduction of recombinant uh, products and then GnRH antagonist um, appeared on the market. And nowadays we seem to go back to milder stimulation, maybe even to natural cycle IVF. So we seem to uh, have come full circle. Now, during a menstrual cycle, there are two processes um, uh, that uh, take place uh, uh, parallel with each other. One of them is the oocyte maturation, and the other is uh, the endometrial buildup. The functional unit responsible for both uh, processes is the ovarian follicle. The activity of the follicle is regulated by gonadotropins, growth factors, cytokines. It's a complex um, uh, endocrine, paracrine, and autocrine uh, process. If we look at this slide, uh, this reminds us on uh, Dr. Salam's presentation when he was talking about the 2 cell 2 gonadotropin theory. The two cells within the follicle are the granulose and the theca cells. The granulose cells primarily respond to FSH, and the, granulose, uh, the theca cells primarily respond to LH. But if you look at these lines, and I'm not going to go over all these arrows, there, there's a multitude of interaction of uh, steroids, peptides, uh, and other uh, growth factors. Now, the gonadotropins are produced in the pituitary, and the pituitary is under the control of the hypothalamus. Uh, GnRH is the force that will um, lead to the release of uh, gonadotropins from the pituitary. GnRH is a decapeptide that is uh, synthesized in the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus. Uh, its secretion is pulsatile and pulse frequency and amplitude changes from the follicular to the luteal phase. It has a very short half-life, uh, which is about two to four minutes. And this is mainly due to the rapid cleavage between amino acids 5, 6, 6, 7, and 9, 10. It mediates its effect via surface receptors on the uh, pituitary. And when um, uh, it binds uh, to the receptor, it induces changes in um, uh, the ion channel uh, functions. If we alter the amino acid sequence, uh, primarily in position 6 and at the C terminal, we can extend the half-life of uh, GnRH. And we have a product that we can use um, in uh, uh, everyday practice. Now, GnRH agonist is available as an intramuscular, subcutaneous, or intranasal uh, product. When it binds to the pituitary uh, receptors, initially it empties the FSH and LH uh, stores and induces a flare effect. Uh, by extending the half-life of GnRH, uh, the receptor ligand uh, complex is then removed from the cell surface and then is uncoupled from the effector system. These steps are called desensitization and downregulation. And with prolonged use, ultimately, we will achieve a hypogonadotropic uh, state, which uh, is part of many of the IVF stimulation protocols. Now, the GnRH antagonist is also created by uh, amino acid substitutions. Uh, when it binds uh, to the receptor, it, it uh, induces a competitive um, uh, inhibition. Its effect is immediate, and it is uh, reversible. GnRH agonist uh, can be used in many different uh, stimulation protocols. 
when it's used in the luteal lung stimulation protocol, uh, it is uh, started in the mid-luteal phase and is administered for about 10 to 14 days. Uh, and stimulation only starts uh, upon uh, the achievement of uh, uh, full suppression. There's the follicular lung stimulation, which is probably not too often used when GnRH agonist is started in the follicular phase. In this case, it needs to be uh, used for about three weeks uh, to achieve suppression before the stimulation can be started. Uh, the follicular short stimulation um, tries to utilize the benefit of the uh, release of FSH and LH from the uh, pituitary uh, stores. So in this case, the GnRH agonist is started together with the gonadotropins. And in the luteal stop uh, protocol, uh, the GnRH agonist is started in the luteal phase, but is stopped at uh, suppression when uh, uh, the gonadotropins are started. Now the GnRH antagonist uh, can be used also in multiple different um, uh, approaches. There's the flexible start when we wait for certain follicle size and certain estradiol level. There's the fixed start when it is started on day six of the stimulation. There's a day two start when uh, the antagonist is started with gonadotropins. This is primarily uh, used for uh, high responders. And you can use a single dose uh, uh, GnRH antagonist or the daily uh, multiple dose GnRH antagonist. So when a new stimulation protocol uh, appears on the market, uh, you really want to prove that it is as good as the previous um, uh, standard of care or even better than that. So when GnRH antagonist uh, was first used, it was uh, compared to the GnRH agonist long uh, stimulation. And very soon, uh, uh, meta-analysis uh, came out that suggested that uh, the uh, most important outcome, and you, you can look at follicle growth, egg yield, fertilization rate, but ultimately the most important outcome is pregnancy rate, live birth rate. So it uh, quickly came out that um, uh, the GnRH antagonist protocol was not as effective as the GnRH agonist long uh, protocol. And they tried to offer some explanation for these findings. And um, some of the explanations are listed here, and they, they said that we may choose the wrong patients for this kind of stimulation. Uh, we may not provide adequate luteal support for these patients. Uh, we may not have identified the best approach, single dose, uh, multiple dose, which day to start it. Um, it clearly induces a different um, uh, hormonal milieu during the stimulation because with the long protocol, you already have suppressed gonadotropins from the very beginning of the stimulation. With the antagonist, you get a rather quick and uh, deep suppression at the start of the antagonist. So this may have an adverse effect uh, on the stimulation. But it also very often uh, came up that we may just have to learn how to use this and it may just take simply time to learn how to use it and we may get better results. So these initial reports were followed by multiple studies that looked at the various aspects of the GnRH um, antagonist stimulation. And I'm going to try to go through over the next couple of slides um, uh, these um, um, different uh, approaches. So the fixed versus flexible start. Fixed starting on day six or flexible. This is usually once the follicles get up to 13, 14 millimeters and the estradiol level gets up to about four, 500 micrograms per milliliter. So one of the early studies was done by Ludwig uh, and colleagues. They randomized 60 patients to fix day six start to flexible start versus single dose um, uh, antagonist start. And what they found that with the flexible start, there was a need for fewer ampules of gonadotropins. There was a lower uh, uh, total uh, need for uh, gonadotropins. Uh, more eggs were collected, but the pregnancy rate was similar. This was confirmed in subsequent studies. Uh, Mokhtar and al, al, al also compared the fixed uh, versus flexible start and uh, found no difference in the stimulation outcome and found no difference in the pregnancy rates. And again, when you have enough studies, you can do a meta-analysis. And uh, this uh, meta-analysis pub published in 2005 was based on four studies. Um, and uh, there was a non-significant benefit with the fixed start but the difference was not significant, so it appears that fixed or flexible start works equally well. Now, should we use a single dose or should we use multiple dose um, GnRH antagonist? The single dose of three milligrams lasts for four days. From the fifth day onwards, we need to add daily antagonist if the stimulation has to be continued. Uh, Lee and colleagues uh, compared single uh, versus multiple dose GnRH antagonist. 
And what they found that the single dose, with a single dose, they achieved the deeper LH suppression. There was somewhat reduced follicular response, lower estradiol level. There were fewer fertilized oocytes. But again, the clinical outcome, pregnancy rate and implantation rates were similar. Uh, there may be some benefits with the single dose. You, uh, the total number of injections is fewer. If you have to do ultrasound and estradiol measurement to decide when to start the flexible stimulation, then with the single dose, um, uh, you may need less um, uh, monitoring. And there are other uh, randomized trials that also showed no difference in the clinical outcome in pregnancy rate with the single versus multiple dose antagonist. Uh, there were some discussions about oral contraceptive pill uh, pretreatment already this morning. Uh, there are certain benefits to the uh, birth control pill uh, pretreatment. One of the major benefits for us clinicians is that it allows a flexible, predictable cycle uh, start. And it also helps some of the patients who have to make arrangements in advance, especially if they have to travel for the treatment and they need to know when exactly to book their plane tickets, their accommodation, uh, when to take time off work. So the contraceptive pill has this benefit. It improves uh, follicle synchronization because it suppresses the late luteal FSH and LH rise that may recruit follicles too early into the stimulation. Therefore, the, the risk for dominant follicle formation or cyst formation is um, uh, reduced. There are certain risks with the uh, uh, contraceptive pill uh, pretreatment. Not everyone tolerates the pill well, and there may be side effects with the pill that uh, uh, may make patients stop the pill or may make them just miserable while on the pill. And we need to see whether it has any adver adverse effects uh, on the stimulation. So Kolibianakis uh, and colleagues in 2006 uh, did a randomized study with contraceptive pill pretreatment versus no uh, pill uh, pretreatment. What they found that in the contraceptive pill group, the stimulation was longer. There was uh, a need for more uh, gonadotropins. Uh, the early pregnancy loss rate was also higher in the contraceptive pill use but the ongoing pregnancy rate was similar. Again, uh, when there are many small studies, a meta-analysis may help. It doesn't always help, but it may help. And the same group performed two meta-analyses. And uh, the two have a different outcome. The first one included four randomized trials. The second one included uh, six randomized trials. And if you look at the odds ratios, they are very similar. But in the second study with more patients, they achieved significance. And they concluded that um, the contraceptive pill pretreatment uh, reduces the pregnancy rate. 